Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and this is the Hollow Audio Bliss headphone amp and preamp. This, it comes in two flavors. The standard edition is $3,000 US dollars, and the KTE, or Kitsune Tuned Edition, is $3,400 US dollars. The KTE version offers some upgraded wiring, some higher quality capacitors, and some higher quality coatings on some of the connectors. I will leave it to Kitsune's website to explain the differences in further detail there. See link down in the description below. This is the KTE version here for review. This was a kind loan to me from Ryan at Mod House with the permission of the folks at Hollow Audio USA. So it is only a loan. It will be going back to Ryan here in the near future. All opinions you're about to hear on this amplifier are mine and mine alone. And I... There will be no affiliate link or anything like that. I will just link you to Kitsune's website in the description below where you can buy this if you wish. My thoughts on this amp are a bit of a mixed bag, and uh, we're going to get into why here, as well as some sonic comparisons with some similarly priced headphone amps and preamps like the Hi Fi Golden Wave Prelude, the Vioelectric HPA V281, the Ferrum Ore and Hypso stack, and some others as well here on the other side of shameless self promotion. So let's get to it. Hello. I'm one of the reasons that Wave Theory can't spend all of his money on audio gear. He wants you to know that your support is vital for keeping the channel running. So if you enjoy Wave Theory's bussin review riz and no cap review style and want to encourage him to stay in the basement so I don't have to listen to his dad jokes as much, like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also send him a donation on PayPal or sign up for the Patreon. Links are in the description. Now on to the review. As usual, we might be here for a while, so make use of the timestamps to jump around in the video and watch the parts that are of most relevance or of interest to you. As I said in the in the top there, like I do have some mixed feelings on this amplifier, and I can see that some of my maybe not so great thoughts on this amp are, could be upsetting to some people. So I'm just a reminder, this is just how I hear it. I am just a guy on the internet. You should not take just my word for this product or any product of that matter. You should collect a whole lot of opinions and then of course use your ears to judge for yourself and you do not have to agree with me. All right. That said, this thing does have some very real sonic strengths as well that we will get to and some drawbacks and I found it to be a little bit uh, signal chain building picky as in pairings with headphones and preamps and, and DACs and things of that nature. It responds in different ways that can either help some of its strengths and mitigate some of its weaknesses to a degree or just double down on some of its weaknesses. So we'll unpack those thoughts um, as well as the video progresses. But with that, let's get into like what this thing is, some of its specs, some of its features, then we'll talk about the build and then of course we'll get into the sound and the comparisons and all of that. So what it is, is a fully class A dual mono and thus fully balanced, if you will, headphone amplifier and preamp. Again, class A, it runs hot, it gets warm. And one of the reasons it's not just because it's class A that it gets warm, it's because this thing can kick out up to 12 watts RMS of power into a 32 ohm load from its balanced output. The power output steps down to three watts per channel RMS from the single ended output here. Um, so you really want to stick to the balanced outputs on this thing. The single ended in output there is really just for convenience. So try to get headphones that have detachable cables and that you can use balanced cabling for. And you have the option of four pin XLR headphone output or 4.4 millimeter Pentacon, though there is something of note on that Pentacon output, which we'll talk about in further detail when we get to the build section here in a moment. But that is a lot of power on tap. You also have the option of changing the output impedance on these on these headphone outputs if you want to play with shifting the sound of your headphone on the wet dry spectrum a little bit by changing the damping factor. If you don't know what damping factor is or what out in output impedance does to the sound, I have a video where I explain that that I will link down into the description below. And we'll talk about what the values are of the output impedance in the build section and then also how they affect the sound, how changing the output impedance affects the sound later on in the sound section of this video as well. All right, 
Um, with that, um, that's the, the basics of it. I mean, there's a, a bevy of inputs and all that it is a fully operational preamp as well. It does not come with a remote control standard, but you can order, at least if I understand Kitsune's website uh, correctly, you can order a uh, remote control to use this as an option if you wish. Okay, but with all of that said, I think we can change up the vantage point here where I show you the build, the menu navigation, talk more about the features such as the output impedance thing, uh, and show you the connections in the back panel and all of that. So let's go ahead and cut to that. All right, let's do a unit tour of the Bliss here. And it's, it's a well-built, nice looking unit. Right, and I'm gonna put it on this little table here and do it from this vantage point because clocking in at 22 pounds, which is about 10 kilos of mass there, it's a heavy unit, so I don't wanna hold it up the whole time. Okay, front panel features here. Um, it, it, well, let's just let's talk about the build here first. And this unit, I am told, has been a demo unit for a while, so it's got some cosmetic imperfections here and there. Um, I did try to polish this up as best I could with a microfiber cloth before filming to at least get all of the dust off of it, but there are a couple of nicks and dings that may or may not show up on the camera, um, but certainly wouldn't be there on a brand new unit, so please forgive those if you see any. All right, what we have here is, I believe this is an aluminum chassis here, with shell and casing on the outside in typical hollow fashion. We have these orange, ish or copper colored panels here on the side. It is present on both sides. Okay, there you see it there. Um, as a nice accent, same color as these front panel buttons here. Up top, at least on, again, I believe this is the Kitsune tuned edition or the KTE edition. We have this nice Kitsune like fox head logo right here as another accent of that same color standing out. All right, and yeah, again, sharp looking unit here. Let's, uh, let me reset the camera and we'll talk about the front panel. All right, so what are all of the buttons and all of that? We have a display window here, which the unit is powered on as far as I know, at least it was. There we go. Uh, I guess it wasn't. Anyway, you see it when you power it on Hollow Bliss shows up there. We've got a nice big display here, right? Um, and, and so forth. Easy to read across the room if you need it to be. Wakes up every time that you adjust the volume. I think you can hear these clicks. Let me move the microphone up here. Okay, you will, you will hear that, right, as you change volume. But unlike some other stepped attenuators that I have used or like clicky volume controls like that, this one, the sound did not bleed into the headphones to uh, my, my recollection. At least it never stood out to me as so doing. All right, so then this is a multifunction knob right here and it is clicky to the touch. You see its default there is to adjust the output level or the volume. Uh, right there. If you hit the also mute button, I think is pretty straightforward. Just mute on and off. But however, this button right here is also a the if you hit the menu button, then this knob is also a multi-function switch here. Okay, that takes you through the different options. You see the different input options there. Hit menu again. You have different output options. You see high and low Z here. Okay, again, you get to it through this knob here. And so what you can do is adjust the output impedance on the uh, headphone outputs with that low Z here, I have it written down. If you're on the low Z output, then from the four pin XLR, the output impedance they claim is basically zero ohms. The 4.4 millimeter Pentacon output they claim as two ohms. The 6.35 millimeter single ended output they claim as one ohm in low. If you switch that to high output impedance, then it becomes 15 ohms, 17 ohms, and eight and a half ohms. Okay, um, so then other options in the menu to look at here, I mean, not only output, you've got the display, so I mean, you can, you can turn the display on and off there, okay, uh, and 
select input that looks to be about the extent of the list there okay then power here you see you had to I had to push and hold it to get it to come on and off and so forth now this system right here with the menu button and then the multifunction knob and all of that it works um, it is not the most elegant thing. My personal preference, especially for a unit that's going to cost multi-thousands of dollars, like this one at either $3,000 or $3,400, is that you never not have the option to control the volume. I would like to be able to navigate the menu and select the different options without having to mess with the volume knob uh, and, and so forth. So, I mean, that's just my personal preference. Your mileage may vary on that. All right. I would like to make a comment on the 4.4 millimeter Pentacon output, and I'm gonna move the camera so you can see this a little bit better here. It is in a recessed opening here in the faceplate, okay? Um, and that has some issues. Namely, I think I told you guys this recently, uh, it's been relatively recent that I picked up a DCA, a Dan Clark Audio E3. Uh, to use as another reference headphone. Um, and Arctic Audio very graciously sent me one of their Magnus cables to use with it, and I asked them to terminate it in 4.4 millimeter Pentacon on the amp end. And that's great, except for look at the diameter of that connector on the barrel there, and it does not go all the way in on the, this jack here on the Bliss, because it's too thick. This recess right here does not have a big enough diameter to accommodate okay, that plug. Now, the Bliss is not alone on this. Here's the Hi Fi Mint Golden Wave Prelude headphone amp and preamp that I have a review of out for as well, and we'll link to in the description below. And yes, you're going to get a very thorough sonic comparison between these two amps here later in this video. But to the issue of the 4.4 millimeter Pentacon connector here on the Magnus cable not sliding all the way in, the same thing happens on the Prelude where we again have a recessed jack and the plug, the barrel of the plug is too thick to go all the way in. So two manufacturers of amplifiers out there specifically, particularly when you're talking about $2,500 and $3,000 to $3,400 amplifiers here, you're going to have to assume, I think, that your users are going to be using aftermarket cables. And sometimes those aftermarket cables are going to be too thick to have a 4.4 millimeter uh, Pentacon connector that can accommodate these small jack recess diameters. Make those bigger. Either don't recess the jack or make this bigger here because the Magnus is also not the only cable I had this issue with, particularly on the Prelude. The Elitec Inferno that I had in the past, I will put a link down below in there too, had the same issue where the plug was too large of a diameter to accommodate the one on the Prelude. And you can see that if it doesn't fit here, it's likely not going to fit on the Bliss either. All right, so my little mini rant on that aside, um, let's move on to other things. Like, I think it's time for me to flip around the Bliss and show you the back panel. All right, amplifier derriere here. And like when I was flipping this around, I really noticed this for the first time. These corners here and here are quite sharp. So just given the heft of this unit, just be careful when you go and uh, if you ever have to move this around, which shouldn't be a lot. You put it on your rack and for most of you, you're going to forget about it. My life is a little different because I am constantly putting things into my system, pulling them out, switching them around, comparing them to other things and all of that. So that's a thing that I had to take note of there. Uh, otherwise, the uh, back panel here. All right. Power input with a master rocker power switch here. This is the Kitsunia tuned edition confirmed by this sticker right here. Okay, then I like this. You have two XLR balanced uh, inputs on this thing. And like for me as a reviewer, I really appreciate that because it makes it easier to compare DACs when you can just directly switch into the unit rather than having to use a bunch of switch boxes, all that. But for an end user, that could also be convenient. Like if you are a vinyl user and if you have a balanced output vinyl preamp, OK, 
Okay, then you can send a digital source into one of these inputs from a DAC. You, then you can run your, your vinyl analog input to the other one if you want. Or you can use two balanced DACs that have different sounds because you like different sounds for different genres of music or whatever. And then you also have the standard single-ended RCA input there. And then over here, you see the complement of both balanced 3-pin XLR and single-ended RCA uh, analog preamp outputs. So there you go. Back panel unit tour. While I'm here, let me give you just a little bit clearer view, hopefully, of that copper finish on the end plates there. Because it does look nice, it is rather reflective. Okay, it also is part of the heat sinking. Like this whole unit gets pretty warm. It's class A amp after all. Okay, it does get pretty warm after use or just leaving it powered on for a while. Um, it does seem like these copper accents here are not just about visual being visually striking. They also seem to be warmer to the touch than most of the rest in the unit. All of it gets warm, okay? Don't kid yourselves. All of this gets warm, and so you're gonna be wanna be careful about what you put on top of it. But these panels on the side feel even warmer, so I think they also play a role in heat sinking for the amp as well. But well-built unit, very solid, very hefty, looks good. I personally like the aesthetic. I have no issues with that. Okay, does run warm, but not extremely hot. Like you can safely touch it, but I don't think particularly on the side panels, I don't think you're gonna wanna leave your hand there for very long if it has been used um, for any length of time. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's solid, it looks good. Um, I personally don't love the whole menu navigation system and the volume control and just the way that's done, um, particularly since you need to use it for input switching and all of that kind of thing. Um, I would like to see input selection in particular be a little bit more direct and quick, okay, um, and not involve the volume knob, but that is just a personal preference again. Other than that, that's the build and most of the features and the connections and all of that. Okay, back to me on camera talking about other things. All right, we'll start turning our attention towards sound. And to begin that, we will start with the gear that I use to test this. So test gear is a lot. As usual, I used digital files. That would have been either uh, lossless or high-res FLAC files or local DSD files. It, local files would have been uh, played back through Rune, even the, uh, the streamed FLAC files would have been streamed through Cobuzz or from Cobuzz also through Rune. Rune endpoints would have included Sonor Ultra Rendu streamers. Um, and then from there, uh, I used three DACs primarily to test this, and they're all very high-end DACs. Ryan of House Mod, first of his name, I believe, um, sent me the Hollow May DAC as well. So a review for that will be coming out in the very near future as well. So I tried that with this amp. I also used my trusty Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC, which would have had to have been connected to um, a Singer SU. 6 DDC to be able to talk to the Sonor Ultra Rendu streamers. And then also I have recently acquired the Lampazator Baltic 3. That would have been connected via direct USB to a, uh, the, a Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer as well. So those are three very high-end DACs that all have very unique sounds and sonic characteristics. And so I did hear some interesting changes in the sound of this unit here using those three. So we'll unpack that a bit here uh, as well. Now, headphones used would have been a lot, okay? Um, from low impedance dynamic driver and planar magnetic all the way up through really hard things to drive. So. The list includes, but probably is not limited to, because I'm certain to forget something here, um, Audio-Technica ATH-ADX5000, which is a high impedance dynamic driver headphone. Focal Radiance, a low impedance dynamic driver headphone. hi fi Min HE1000SE, a low impedance easy driving planar. The Headphone Head 2, a ribbon driver um, headphone, kind of medium difficulty drive. Dan Clark Audio E3, planar magnetic headphone closed back, also kind of a medium difficulty drive. Buyer Dynamic DT880 600 ohm that is balanced modded. So also like again, high impedance dynamic driver headphone there. 
uh, Focal Utopia, which is notoriously picky headphone, and then Hi-Fi Men Susvara also got a fair amount of time on this as well. There are probably others in there that the name is just escaping me at the moment, but you can see it's a fairly comprehensive list. And I tried a, a wide variety of headphones on this thing because, again, there were some different results based on the headphone that I used here, and it didn't seem to be limited to like this type of headphone does this type of thing on this amplifier. It very much seemed to be individual headphones behaving in different ways on this amp. So let's start unpacking all of that by getting into the sound. And this is really where the mixed bag nature of this device uh, comes in because there are some very real sonic strengths and then there are also what I would consider weaknesses. Again, you trust your ears and your mileage may vary on any of these things and we are not required to have the same opinion of this amp. It is okay to disagree. All right, so the presentation or let, let's start with like the perceived frequency response on this the frequency extension in both directions meaning both in the to the bass and in the treble on this thing is not so great it's really one of the the weaker um uh, amps that I've heard at any price in that regard. So both the sub bass and the air frequencies are rolled off a little bit and pulled back in the presentation in terms of presence relative to the rest of the frequency spectrum. So to my ears, and this happens on most of the headphones and headphone types I heard, so this is just a very consistent result on this particular amp and it's just the nature of its sound is it kind of has an upside down U shape or like a dome shape kind of perceived frequency response to my ear um, on that. Now, it also manages to sound warm, right? So it's overall like, even though it's rolled off at either end, so it kind of has like this perceived upside down U uh, frequency response as a whole, there is a little bit of extra emphasis on the upper bass, lower mids that does give it some warmth. And you probably heard from other reviewers or if you've been on the forums at HeadFi and other places talking about the warmth and like tube-like nature of this sound. I definitely agree with the warmth here. I'm going to have to take issue with the tube-like sound, which we'll unpack here in a little bit um, as well. Okay, so upside down U-shape with some warmth is kind of like the thousand foot view of the perceived frequency response to my ear. Now let's get to the presentational aspects of it. Strengths of the presentation. It is a very smooth and very refined sound with lots of fine level control, right? Um, so it just, it sounds very polished, very buttoned up, very mature in its overall presentation for the sounds that it does create there. So that is definitely a strength. I have heard the word liquid used by a lot of uh, folks out there on the internet to describe the sound of this. It has a very liquid sound. I am less familiar and you usually don't hear me use the term liquid. I think what that refers to is just that the sound here is very smooth and it has a very nice flow to it. It. Um, it there as I that's my interpretation of what they mean by liquid and like what I am hearing on this thing so just take that for what it's worth but know that I am not super comfortable using the term liquid there um, it is a little bit it does, like I can kind of get where people are coming from saying that this has a tube like sound because like maybe that liquid thing it also does sound a little bit wet to me like it's not a dry sounding amp or anything but it like it just it it has a nice blend and flow from the trailing ends of a leading tone to the leading edge of its subsequent tone. Like it kind of flows nicely one into the other without sounding too thick or syrupy in that way. Um, but also like not, it, you know, it's not dry sounding either. There are a couple of, uh, let's talk about the soundstage size too. Like it's very holographic within the soundstage that it does create. And the soundstage is a little bit more on the intimate side here. It is not a big and expansive soundstager um, like a lot of class A amps around its price are. It is more on the intimate side here. Um, but within its soundstage, particularly in two dimensions, and it's not the two dimensions you would expect. We're gonna come back to that in a moment here. Okay, that in the two dimensions that it does really well, it does a very good job of spatial separation and imaging and layering and that sort of thing uh, in there. So within its soundstage, which is a bit smaller, it is very holographic uh, in there as well. 
Other strengths before we get to the weaknesses. The sonic background on this thing is very, very dark. So sounds do kind of seem like they kind of pop in and out of a black void of existence there, but it does it in a natural and realistic way and not in like an odd artificial, for lack of better term, topping way. Okay. Um, and so that I thought was good too. Now its own noise floor is very well. And I think this point here will help us transition from the strengths into the weaknesses a little bit here as well. Its own noise floor, very, very low, basically vanishing low. However, if there is a high noise floor in a recording, and one example that just pops into my head here would be um, Sympathy for the Devil by uh, the Rolling Stones. Like that track just being an older track and it's just one of many, right? Like it's, it's certainly not just this track, it's just an example, has its own somewhat high noise floor. So there's some hiss in the sound of that track just all throughout it. And this unit here kind of brings that hiss to heel a little bit. And it's like not as noticeable or as forward as it is on some other amps. And I have mixed feelings on that because that hiss is in the signal. It is in the recording, right? So it should be reproduced by an amplifier that's doing a faithful job of reproducing the signal. So the fact that this pulls that back a little bit is positive insofar as it's just less irritating and less grating and less fatiguing if you're listening to old recordings that are full of that hiss all the time. But I'm a little skeptical as to whether or not that's actually a good thing in terms of overall sonic performance because it's in the signal. Tell me what's in the signal. I'm okay with a $3,000 amplifier faithfully telling me what is in the signal. And so the fact that it's changing that a little bit gives me some pause on this one. What are the other things that give me some pause? Let's talk about what my perceptions of the weaknesses are here um, a little bit. Okay. It has a high power output rating. That 12 watts per channel is a lot, but it does not sound particularly powerful. It is a bit dynamically challenged. It is not a particularly impactful amplifier, particularly in the low end. So like bass string plucks, uh, kick drum hits, and all of those things, they just don't have a whole lot of authority to them in there. Likewise, snare drums and all of that, I have heard much snappier and much like quicker, and especially on the attack. Uh, on there, just a lot more snappiness and just like, oh, there it is, just bang, right? Um, kind of presentation to snare drums that I personally like. This one just kind of smooths out the leading edges on some of those tones, and I think that has an impact on its overall ability to be physical and impactful in the sound. Now, that's going to be a preference thing. I have, as I have said numerous times, am primarily rock and metal listener, so I like the sound to be a little bit bit more dynamic, a little bit more impactful, a little bit more lively. This one is just a little bit too over smooth for my liking for a genre such as that. Okay. So it's kind of like the Vioelectric HPA V550 in that regard. Like I overall liked the V550. It just, it was not as dynamically impactful as some of its uh, sibling units uh, in Lake People's line, be it under the Vioelectric name or the Lake People name or the Nimbus um, name, right? So this one is kind of like that, um, shares that trait there of just being a little bit dynamically challenged. The other big thing that jumps out to me, and this, in my opinion, I mean, it is, I mean, all of this is preference-based stuff, but this, in my opinion, is more of a technical limitation than just the dynamic, uh, the, the, the somewhat subdued dynamics. And that is, despite its warmth, and despite its tube-like liquidity or wetness, however you want to describe that, it somehow manages to sound lean. Part of that is because of the rolled off sub bass. It just the, the weight of everything, it's just everything seems to be lacking in a little bit of weight. It just sounds a little bit overall tonally lean. And it's very unique in terms of uh, this is the first time I have heard a combination of this level of warmth with this level of lean. And so that's very unusual and took some getting used to it. Again, that might be a trait that some of you like. I didn't particularly enjoy that aspect of it. And again, I think a lot of that does come back to the just uh, the sub bass being a little bit lacking. It just needs a little bit more heft to its overall tone and its overall presentation. Okay, at least to sound realistic or natural to my ears on on that. 
All right, so that to, like that is like one of the bigger limitations of its sound to these ears and to my preferences. Another one, let's come back to that spatial presentation that I mentioned. I said that it's very good with the imaging and the separation and all of that in two dimensions, but it's not the two dimensions that you think of. The sound stage that you typically think of, the sound stage to me sounds somewhat two dimensional. Typically, when you hear two dimensional sound stage, most of the times it's like width and height that you get. And so you get that wall of sound uh, kind of, of, of presentation and perception to it. This one, the two dimensions are in the width and in the depth and the height is kind of compressed. Like there's a higher floor and a lower ceiling okay, on, on most headphones. So it's almost like a horizontal plane of sound coming from this one. And that's very odd and something that I really have not heard from any amp at any price. Now, it is not completely devoid of height information. It's just that it sounds this way. And like, I, I, that's one of the things that I noticed when I first started this, I'm just like, you know, using a hi-fi men headphone, for example, because hi-fi men, they have that great soundstage height that just sounds big and grand and everything. And that, even on those things, it was pushing it this way, sounded like to me. And then when I started getting to comparisons with other amps, which we'll get into more detail here soon, like I would definitely hear like this nice big sound vertically and then just, Okay, kind of pancake that down when I'd switch to this amplifier or hear it go the other way and just really wake up if I started this and then switched to another amp. So that was a really odd thing for me and it did not happen on every single headphone, but it happened on most of them. Okay, and it also seemed to be DAC. Um, it, it didn't matter what DAC I used there. It did it on all three of those really high quality DACs that I mentioned there as well. So that was just a very unique and odd thing about the presentation here that I could never quite get my brain to get used to here in the time that I that I had it. Okay. Um, resolution, I haven't talked about that. Resolution, texturing, detail retrieval, that sort of thing. Right in line for what it needs to be. It's not standout for its price, but you know, for a three to thirty three thousand to thirty four hundred dollar amp, seems absolutely appropriate and right in line with the market that I, uh, you know, other pieces in the market that I have heard there as well. But those those things, the the odd spatial aspect of it of compressing the height. The, the dynamics being a bit lacking, but also just the way it handles transients, the attacks of, of tones and all that just don't sound quite right to me on this. They sound a little bit too splashy and a little bit too spread out and just overall a little bit too nice, if you will, at least for the genres of music that I like to listen to. Okay, and then just like with, and then you add in the frequency extension issues and just the overall leanness to the sound despite being oddly warm and putting those two together in a way that just I haven't gotten my brain to get used to yet. There really is a mixed bag on this on its own for sound quality reasons. Now, is all lost? Not necessarily. You can help some of its weaknesses with signal chain care. Unfortunately, Hollow's own Maydac is not the best match to this to my ears. It doubles down on the leanness of that sound. The May I, um, is a fine sounding DAC and I will get to that in my review as well, but it does not help flesh out the sub bass presence on this, which it really needs. It does not help wake up the dynamics, which this also really needs. And it ends up kind of doubling down on some of the issues that this amplifier has to my ears and to my preferences again. So I didn't like that particular combination. Um, that's not the first time that I have not thought that I have thought that the combination within the same company of amp and DAC was not the best. For the Ferrum stack, the Vonla and the Orr, I didn't think were the best match to each other either. So that is a thing that is maybe a trend setting up that uh, sometimes you just need to go across brands to really get these things to to uh, uh, talk well to each other. The, the Berkeley Alpha Series 2 helped a little bit. The Alpha Series 2 has a more dynamic sound to it than the, the May DAC does. And the Berkeley Alpha always ha also has very good frequency extension in both directions. So it helped bring up some of the sub bass here, helped with the air roll off a little bit more here. So it sounded a little bit more tonally even throughout the entire frequency spectrum. And so thus a little bit less upside down you in its uh, frequency response, but it wasn't a complete 
fix either. It also did make the sound stage a little bit bigger because okay, the Alpha is a large sound stager in there too. So that you can like, help that as well. I thought the Baltic 3, however, was the best match to this because the Baltic 3 has a really robust, powerful low end to it. And that helped bring some of the sub bass presence into the, back into the sound here, which helped flesh it out a little bit. Again, not a complete fix. I still noticed its shortcomings when I did comparisons to other amps, but it helps a fair amount. But what the Baltic is not gonna do is make the sound stage all that much bigger if you like a bigger stage. Again, sound stage size is a preference thing. It did not help with, I mean, none of the other DACs helped with the vertical compression aspect of the stage. Okay, but the Baltic also is not gonna like help with the air extension on this very much either, okay? But that was enough switching around to tell me that you can help out the sound of this with DAC pairings a little bit. Um, so feel free to play around if you have one of these. You can probably find a DAC that's going to help address some of its shortcomings a little bit. Likewise with headphones. Um, bad matches to this were headphones that were generally just already tonally lean and lacking a bit in sub bass. Just did not work well. Two examples that I have on hand for that would be the Head Headphone 2 and the Audio-Technica ATH ADX 5000. Those are more neutral bright kind of sound and they need some sub bass help. This does not give it to them. The, uh, eight, the, the Audio-Technica has a little bit of an uneven frequency response in general. And so the general mid-centric nature of the sound here because of the upside down U frequency response to this really exacerbates some of the issues on the ADX 5000, which a review for that is coming up soon. And so like those, those two and then the headphone two, not great matches to this. And like, again, kind of doubles down on some of its issues rather than helping them out. Headphones that helped out this issue, there was one in particular that stood out, and that would be the Bayer DT880 600 ohm balanced mod. For whatever reason, that headphone seemed to synergize with this amplifier really well. Made the sound stage bigger, helped some with that vertical compression, like opened that up a little bit. I don't know why, it just did, okay? Um, was a little bit more dynamic than a lot of the other headphones in there. Um, and was also the headphone that like most showed the difference from changing the output impedance. Even the, the ADX 5000 didn't really do that. So like the changing the output impedance, that was like the only headphone that I really noticed a change on with the DT880. It just made it go a little bit wetter, smoother overall kind of sound. More liquid if you want to use that term, although I'm not convinced that's the place to use it. Okay. Um, but like that happened there the most with this headphone. The Susvara, and I know this amp is praised as a Susvara amp, um, I disagree. Like, the Susvara had one of the worst vertical compression changes in the soundstage, and like noticed, I noticed the lack of dynamics and sub-bass presence a lot on the Sus, and I honestly just didn't really like that combination in comparison with what some of the competitors at this price point are capable of giving me with the Susvara. The Dan Clark E3, the Focal Utopia, the Hi-Fi-Min HE1000SE were all just kind of meh, or as the kids these days are saying, mid, I guess, on this uh, amplifier here. They were neither really good nor really bad. They were just kind of there, okay? So again, there it stands to reason that the Bayer DT880 is not the only headphone for which this will synergize well. And that's probably good because that's a $200 headphone and I don't think people are buying a $3,000 or $3,400 amp to use with a balanced modded $200 headphone, okay? But it does stand to reason there are other good matches out there. You may just have to find them, okay? Um, but there are also bad matches to this and then there are a lot of just eh kind of matches, again, to my ears. All right. So on its own, even without comparisons to other units there. I didn't love this. I recognize that it had some strengths, but I also recognize that it had some weaknesses. And I just, if it were my money and if I were looking for an amp, I would personally not choose this one. Let's talk about some comparisons though. And let me actually get some of them and put them on this table here so that we can just look at them all at the same time. All right, so on this table here, I was able to construct a little mini mount amperist. So 
clearly on hand and for direct comparison, I had available the Hi-Fi Men Golden Wave Prelude amplifier, which is also a Class A amp and lists for $2,500 US dollars. I had the Headamp GSX Mini, also a Class A amp that lists for about $2,000 US dollars. And then I have the Vioelectric HPA V281, the original model, not the limited edition, but it is a Class A amplifier. The limited edition, which I understand has just a little bit different aesthetic, a 4.4 millimeter balance output on it, and uh, just a different casing, but as otherwise the same amplifier is currently being sold for 2,800 US dollars. I'll also mention the comparison to the Bliss between that and the Ferrum or and Hypso stack, which from memory I think goes for for about 3,100 US dollars, right in that range. I can also comment on the Vioelectric HPA V550, which I think is around 3,500, going from memory that might be a little bit off. And then also the uh, LTA Z10E, excuse me, not the Z10E, the LTA MZ3, which is a tube amp that goes for 3,700 US dollars. And I can comment on all of those. And are there any others in there in the price range out there that I have heard? Probably. Yes, iFi Pro iCAN Signature Edition, which I want to say is about $2,200, $2,300. And then the SPL Fonitor X, which is in that price range, but I do not remember the actual price of it. Um, I will link to my review. That's an older one now. It has been a while. So I cannot compare all of those right up next to the Bliss, but hopefully that will help you provide like some of my knowledge or provide you with some of what I understand the Hi-Fi head amp mark market context to be around the price of the bliss. So let's kind of dive in here a little bit. All right. Should you get the Prelude or the Bliss? Again, that depends. I found like, let's just go to kind of do it this way. The Bliss is one of the more refined and smooth sounding amplifiers of that entire list that I just named. It would probably be the Vioelectric HPA V550 that is the closest comparison to the Bliss in terms of how refined and smooth the overall sound is. The, uh, the warmth of the Bliss, at least in terms of the sound, is also shared with the Prelude, the, v, the, the V281 um, especially, and a little bit the V550, although not quite as much on that V550 there. It's a little bit more neutrally tuned. However, the Prelude, the V281, the 550 and all that, despite there being them being a little bit on the warmer side, they do not sound as lean as the Bliss does because they are not rolling off the sub bass. To the contrary, the V281 especially has a much more robust, full, impactful sub bass to it with a healthy amount of slam and just a more rounded, full kind of presentation in the low end. The Prelude is reasonably close to that, and sorry there's a fly buzzing around, hopefully that doesn't distract too much. Okay, but the Prelude, uh, trends that way. It is not quite as warm or as robust uh, in the low end of most headphones, except for with the Susvara. With the Susvara, and one of the reasons why I think Hi-Fi Men snatched up Golden Wave and started selling it under their branding, is uh, because the dynamics and the impact and the slam really wake up on the Susvara on this amp, um, much more so in, in comparison to other amps um, out there as well. Now the Ferrum Oren Hypsos is going to be more dynamic than the Bliss, but not as dynamic as the V281 or the Prelude, especially if the Prelude is on the Susvara. The Oren Hypsos is also going to be a little bit more neutrally tuned. It is going to share a little bit of, of the, the sound stage size because it's a little bit of a smaller stager as well, like the Bliss is, um, whereas the Prelude, the V281, and even the Mini here are more big and expansive sound stagers. Uh, the V550 I think also had, not a huge but a little bit bigger and then like the, the LTA MZ3 a bigger sound stager to my memory in there as well okay but um but the 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 or and hypsos are going to be closer to what the 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 bliss is doing in terms of sound stage size but the bliss is the only one that's going to do that vertical sound stage compression none of these others do that and even a lot of other amps that are either a lot less expensive than this group or more expensive than this group don't do that vertical staging compression that the bliss is doing to my ears either 
In terms of like DAC and headphone pickiness, the Bliss is also one of the more so, um, the pickier units of this entire grouping. Um, in particular, like the Mini in particular is very, very headphone picky. I think in my review of it, I said something like 60% of the time it works all the time to like kind of quote that Anchorman uh, joke in there. And that's because it either really likes or very strongly dislikes the headphone that you plug into it. But the Mini is very, very DAC friendly. That whatever DAC you plug into it, you get that sound coming out uh, from the Mini with the Mini's flavor, but you definitely hear the DAC sound coming through. Okay, that's mostly true of the Bliss in my experience as well. It seems to be very DAC friendly, but it is also headphone picky. However, when the Bliss doesn't work quite as well with a headphone as some others, it is not as angry about it as the Mini can get. So that's something there. How, but also, however, however, a headphone that does work really well on the Mini is the hi fi Min HE1000 SE. And I had to work really, really hard to hear if the Bliss had much of a technical advantage over the Mini with that particular headphone. And eventually I got there, which notwithstanding the vertical compression, if you take that out, then the Bliss was slightly more resolving, um, a little bit more overall controlled, a little bit more holographic than the Mini was. But the Mini had a little bit more physical impact and a bigger stage, but it clearly was not as good in the depth dimension in particular. But boy, did I have to work really hard to hear the advantages that the Bliss had over the Mini for that headphone. Right, so like when the mini hits, it hits big, okay? And does get like up in this group in terms of how well it can perform, okay? Um, with a very narrow range of headphones. So that's something to keep in mind here as well, okay? But um, the resolution of the Bliss KTE here, I found to be like right on par with the Prelude, right on par with the V281. Resolution, texturing, the holography within their sound stages was very comparable, okay, all that. There was like the, the, the Bliss pulled back signal hiss, like so if they're the noise floor on a track, like I mentioned before, the Bliss pulled that back, whereas like the V281 in particular will almost emphasize it. And so it sounds like it's a noisy amp, even though it's not, it just, if there's a noise floor in the track, it kind of pulls that out more for whatever reason that the Bliss doesn't do. And again, I'm not completely convinced that the Bliss pulling that back is a good thing. I think the prelude in between those two does the best job of saying, here's the track noise floor. It's just going to be there, but we're not going to push it forward like the V281 does or pull it back like the, the Bliss does. Okay, so there is that as well. Okay, overall though, like I think personally, the V281 and the Prelude, all things said and done, are the better values than the Bliss KTE in particular here. I have not heard the level one or the standard uh, bliss, so I can't really say, although if this one sounds better than that, it's just gonna make the point even more salient. I think the total performance package here for nearly $1,000 less, so $900 less and $600 less here between these two, um, it really tips the scales in their favor in terms of, uh, for me, my preferences, the types of sound that I prefer, the types of genres of music I listen to, really tips the scale towards these two. I would even probably take the Mini over the Bliss if I had a headphone, like if my headphone collection was the HE1000SE and like a, a Focal TH900 Mark II, which this one sounds really, really good with, then this would be my amp then, uh, and the Bliss would not be either. I would also take the Ferrum Ore, personally with the Hypsos, over the Bliss myself um, there. Um, I probably would prefer, prefer the V550 to the Bliss. I definitely would prefer the LTA MZ3 to the Bliss. I would take the Bliss over the i5 Pro ICANN Signature Edition. 
And it's been a long time since I have heard it, but I will probably would prefer it to the SPL Fonitor X because the Fonitor X, even more to my memory than what the Bliss was doing, kind of rolled off the sub bass and like had the dynamics suffer a little bit, but it was a huge sound stage or one of the biggest sound stage, sound staging amps I have ever heard. Okay, but I still think that overall my preferences might lead me more towards Bliss than to the SPL Fonitor X. Okay. So um, I think I will go ahead and wrap up this video then. The Hollow Audio Bliss, this is the KTE edition, not for me. It does have some sonic strengths in terms of how refined and smooth it sound is. It does have a lot of control. It has a lot of output power. It can drive just about any type of headphone, but unfortunately I found it to be a bit headphone picky in terms of a synergistic, uh, in terms of synergy anyway. It, uh, it synergized really well with one particular headphone in the Bayer DT880 Balanced Modded 600 Ohm Edition that I don't think anybody's going to care about because of the price mismatch there. Um, so, but that stands to reason there could be other headphones out there then that it would synergize with really well as well. You can mitigate some of its shortcomings in terms of like the dynamics and the lack of sub bass presence with DAC pairings as well, or you can double down on its shortcomings, which can either be undesirable, or if you just like the way that it doubles down, then that could be of interest to you as well. But unfortunately, and I really don't enjoy saying things like this, but ethically I have to, is I don't think the Bliss stacks up all that well for the money compared to what you can get at this price point from its competitors, okay? And again, I do not enjoy saying that, but it's just what my ears and my preferences and my hopefully now considerable listening experience with a wide range of products at this price and below and above uh, tells me where it fits into the market and it just doesn't fit in particularly well. Okay, so, um, I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching my review of the Hollow Audio Bliss. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment if you have not already. Check out my PayPal and my Patreon, and generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. And as always, enjoy the music.